So, hello all of you, dear friends. Um, I would like to welcome you in behalf of Darul uh, Union for Antirism and Peace Policy. Thank you for joining us this evening and I also would like to welcome all the viewers um, who are live stream uh, via Facebook um, and listening to this lecture today. And of course and foremost I would like to welcome Feirouz Sharkawi from Grassroots Jerusalem. Thank and thank you uh, her very much for coming this far away from occupied Palestine to, to Europe and to present us her lecture and um, this book, Wujud, a very special travel guide and the result of, in our view, a very important work of grassroots Jerusalem on the political facts in Palestine and in Jerusalem Al-Quds. Grassroots um, uh, Jerusalem is a platform um, of Palestinians for Palestinian community-based mobilization for leadership and advocacy in occupied Jerusalem uh, to resist the Israeli policy of displacement, colonization and disempowerment. We met Feirouz um, and her colleagues last year for the first time and we were really deeply impressed from uh, the work of, of grassroots Jerusalem and we are very, very glad that we can hear and listen uh, to her this evening about the work of Grassroots uh, Jerusalem, about uh, Wujud, and about the special situation um, working under conditions of occupation, uh, Israeli occupation. Uh, let me just give, give you a short uh, introduction of the hosting organization, Daral Junub, really short. The association Daral Junub um, was founded uh, 16 years ago. Uh, with its major focus first on the anti-war movement against the imperial wars against the people in Afghanistan, Iraq and Palestine and more and more become with a major focus on anti-colonial and anti-racist struggles in general and in awareness building of the global north-south so-called conflict but always with a very special focus um, on Palestine. So with this very short introduction um, I would uh, save time for the lecture and hand over to Ferus. Just, uh, by the way, please keep in mind this is a public uh, event, so uh, we reserve to film and photograph uh, the whole lecture. If you want, uh, I mean, if you don't want to be on the pictures, just uh, avoid to be uh, to look at the camera. So, thank you and Ferus. Shukran, thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here to share uh, uh, our uh, um, story about Jerusalem with you. As Oliver said, I work as uh, the Global Mobilization Coordinator at Grassroots Al-Quds, Grassroots Jerusalem, a platform for Palestinian uh, uh, civil society and community mobilization and networking in Jerusalem. Our main goal is to contribute to the creation of a Palestinian long-term strategy for the city because the way things are going in Jerusalem today, it feels like everyone has a say about the destiny and the future of Jerusalem, except for the Palestinians living in it. On the one hand, the Israeli occupation authorities have very clear plans for Jerusalem. These are plans to annex the land and displace the people, as I will be explaining shortly. On the other hand, our own political leadership is totally absent from the city uh, uh, due to the Oslo agreement, but not only, the Palestinian Authority does not have any jurisdiction in Jerusalem, so it cannot affect the political reality there. Uh, um, I would also say as a side note that this is not necessarily a bad thing. I am happy to uh, discuss that afterwards in the questions and answers section. Uh, but as a result, advocacy in our name as Palestinians in Jerusalem and development in our communities are usually left in the hands of international actors, United Nations agencies, international NGOs and donors who come all under the title of international aid to Palestine, but the reality is they are not aiding the Palestinian people. They are actually part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Again, happy to expand on everything later. But as a result, we live in a vacuum as Palestinian communities in Jerusalem. And Grassroots Al-Quds was established uh, uh, in 2011 to serve as a platform for community mobilization and networking. What we do is map the city, map Jerusalem, research its story, and then 
uh, do our best to support local mobilization uh, organizations that are uh, organizing and are uh, mobilizing within their own communities. We look for ways to support this uh, mobilization. And at the same time, our goal is also to gather organizations around one table so that they can together discuss our own long-term plans for the city. So what we do is research uh, on Jerusalem. We have a research department that uh, gathers oral history and stories from community members as well as research the reality today and the story of each community in Jerusalem today. When I say communities, I mean the urban neighborhoods as well as the villages of the Jerusalem district as well as the two refugee camps within the district. And then we tell their stories. On our website, you can read the community stories of the different Jerusalem parts, those both th those inside and outside the wall. In addition, we also create actual maps of these communities and of Jerusalem in general. We think that there is a need for Palestinian maps of the city. Uh, we will be talking a bit about maps today within the context of tourism, and uh, uh, clearly the Israeli maps uh, follow a certain political narrative, and so they show specific parts of the city and not others. Uh, in addition, we have a local mobilization department. This department's role is to uh, support the mobilization through the, uh, uh, um, let's say, finding the resources that are needed for this mobilization, resources that we believe are available from the community for the community. Uh, our goal is to help organizations and grassroots movements not only mobilize, but also do so independently from donors and donor dictations. And in addition, we have a, a global mobilization uh, uh, department that provides political tours on the ground in Jerusalem and also does speaking tours around the world like the one I'm doing now. So this is Grassroots Al-Quds in a nutshell. Part of our global mobilization was the production of Wujud, the book that is the focus of our conversation today. Wujud is Arabic for existence, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, I will talk about it after I start with the political context that has led to the creation of this book. So allow me to use a slideshow just to help you uh, uh, follow. Uh, and let's start first talking about the political reality that we Palestinians live in Jerusalem today. Since the second occupation, the occupation of 1967, the eastern part of the city was occupied, and since that war uh, uh, in June 67, the Israeli occupation authorities have started making special plans for Jerusalem. Maybe it's important to say that, in general, the divide and conquer policy is the one that the, this colonial system uses in Palestine, dividing Palestinians into different groups that have different political realities. It makes it very, or much easier to control these communities and to to uh, dispossess and oppress these communities. We find it much harder to cooperate and coordinate having to live different political realities. So on the one hand, we have the Palestinians living in 48 occupied territory. These Palestinians are, uh, uh, were, uh, became forcibly citizens of the state of Israel in 1948. These Palestinians live a very special political reality, but then Palestinians that were occupied in 1967 lived different uh, realities. There is the special reality and horrible reality in the Gaza Strip today. In addition, there is the West Bank, and the eastern part of Jerusalem is part of the West Bank, but there is a huge difference between the reality that Palestinians live in Ramallah or Jenin or Hebron and that that we live in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is our main focus today, and of course there is the Palestinian diaspora all, all around the world and the refugees and their own special reality as well. Now, in Jerusalem, it is not the story of uh, 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 military control, like the one that is in the nearby Ramallah or Beit Lahem, for example, but rather a reality of displacement. The Palestinian people in Jerusalem are not welcome to stay in their own city. And since the 1967 occupation, the Israeli occupation authorities have made clear plans for Jerusalem. The first master plan that was created uh, for Jerusalem in uh, the early 70s, around 1970, 
uh, a master plan called Jerusalem 2020, which is a 50-year development plan that was supposed to be implemented between 1970 and 2020. In that master plan, for the first time, officially and openly, the Israeli occupation authorities mentioned the demographic goal that they have for Jerusalem. They call it a demographic balance of 70% Jewish, 30% non-Jewish their own terminology. In other words, 70% Israeli, 30% Palestinian. In order to achieve and maintain this demographic imbalance, if I may correct the term, the Israeli authorities have designed and started implementing various tools of displacement policies that displace Palestinians and push Palestinian residents outside of the city. Starting with the uh, uh, special legal status that the Palestinians have. I will talk about borders and about the wall uh, uh, in a second, but the legal status that the Palestinians hold in Jerusalem is, was the first tool of displacement designed to push them outside of the city. The uh, 66,000 Palestinian residents who were living in the newly occupied territory in 67, that was declared as the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem, these Palestinians were given against their will an Israeli legal status called, misleadingly, a permanent residency. This permanent residency status is not unique to Israel. Many other countries around the world have it. Usually, they give it to immigrants, someone who wishes to immigrate to a new state in order to live there continuously, legally, be able to work or, say, just live there or live with a partner uh, from that state, people need to apply for some sort of a permanent residency status. And uh, uh, in order to, to hold this status, these immigrants need to fulfill a whole list of criteria that uh, uh, grant them the permit to remain in the new country. What makes it very interesting that the Palestinians were given this legal status by the state that immigrated to their own city, and so the occupation authorities treat the Palestinian indigenous uh, residents of Jerusalem as immigrants to their own city. And according to the Israeli law, Palestinian residents in Jerusalem have to continu continuously prove that Jerusalem is their center of life, the so-called center of life, which means that they, first of all, live physically physically in the city, that they have a physical address. They either own or rent a house. In addition, they have to prove that they pay their taxes in the state of Israel, and especially the Arnona, the housing tax. In addition to that, they have to prove that they use water and electricity in Jerusalem as a proof that they do actually practically live in that physical address that they provided. In addition, they need to send their kids to school within the municipal boundaries of the city and receive medical care in the city of Jerusalem. And if they fail to prove all of these criteria, according to the Israeli law, they are not entitled to that permit that they can, with it, live in the city, and they have to leave. In addition to that, according to the Israeli law, a Palestinian from Jerusalem holding the residency status cannot simply travel for a long time, be gone for a long time, without risking not being allowed back in. In the beginning, the period was seven years. On paper, the period is seven years. This is according to the Israeli law called entry into Israel. And in, in the mid-90s, the, the rules changed, even though the, the, the law itself on the paper did not. But that period was shortened to three years. And sometimes you risk not being allowed back in, even if you are gone for one year or two years. So you can imagine what this means for us in real life. It means that Palestinians cannot simply simply to decide to go live somewhere else outside of Jerusalem. And I am not talking about moving to Vienna. I am talking about also moving to the nearby cities of Ramallah or Bethlehem or Hebron without risking not being allowed back into their own city. So a Palestinian young woman who has just graduated high school and wishes to go study abroad cannot do that without always having to come back and check in, put that stamp on her travel document and say, I haven't moved my so-called center of life. In addition, Palestinians do have to produce all of that, uh, all of those papers to show that they live in Jerusalem, but that does not grant them uh, uh, safety or secure security to stay in their city. We have to always be up for the test. 
Israeli officials, employees of the National Insurance Institution or of the Ministry of Interior come to our homes in the middle of the night when we are supposed to be sleeping in our home, knock on our door. First of all, to check. Are we going to open that door? Are we going to be sleeping in our Jerusalem house? If we are in the house, that's not proof enough. Then they will go directly to our kitchen. They will open our fridge and they will check. Do we have fresh bread and milk in our Jerusalem house? Because if we're having coffee and toast somewhere else in the morning, then Jerusalem is not the center of our lives. Later, they will go to our bedrooms and bathrooms and they will check. Do we have towels, underwear? a toothbrush and toothpaste in our Jerusalem house. Because if we're showering and brushing our teeth somewhere else, then we are not centered in Jerusalem. And if we fail to prove all of this, then we are legally deported outside of the city. Only through the use of this very direct tool of displacement, the Israeli occupation has displaced 15,000 Palestinians so far. Since 1967, 15,000 Palestinian Jerusalemites lost the right to remain or to return to their city due to that uh, uh, Israeli law and Israeli policy of the center of life. But of course, Palestinians are displaced in many other various reasons. And uh, next, I will speak about planning policies. Urban planning is political everywhere, but especially in Palestine and especially in Jerusalem, it is used very clearly as a tool of displacement against the Palestinian residents in the city. Starting with land policies and especially land confiscation. This is a context of settler colonialism, and so land is the core of the issue. And taking away the land, dispossessing the Palestinians, is a very important tool of control and of occupation and colonization. So Palestinian lands are confiscated all the time in Jerusalem for many reasons and many, many purposes. First of all, for the construction of colonies, settlements around and also inside, in the heart of our neighborhoods. Palestinian lands are legally uh, 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 confiscated from their owners and then we witness how a colony is built, a settlement is built on those lands. Uh, uh, army use, for example, is another justified reason for confiscating Palestinian lands. The building of the wall ate up a lot of Palestinian privately owned lands when it was built, not only in Jerusalem, but elsewhere around the West Bank. In addition, land is confiscated in Jerusalem for the establishment of so-called national parks. National parks are supposed to be a good idea. National parks are supposed to be a way to protect nature, to protect environment, to protect plants, birds, and life. In Palestine, in Jerusalem, national parks are a tool to displace, dispossess, and kill life. In Jerusalem, in the eastern part of Jerusalem alone, there are seven uh, national parks today, either existing or planned, and they all happen to be sitting on Palestinian privately owned land that was conf confiscated from its owners. And if you look at the map of national parks in Jerusalem, you will also notice that they happen to be located on the exam exact last bits and pieces of land that we owned and into which our communities can naturally grow. In Jerusalem, the Israeli municipality and the Israeli uh, uh, government do not expand Palestinian neighborhoods. They do not allow the expansion of Palestinian neighborhoods and villages. Master plans are not expanded every 15 to 18 years as any authority should do uh, uh, around the world. In Jerusalem, master plans are not expanded and so uh, 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 not only that we don't have more land to fit our natural growth, but also our land is taken away to prevent that, nat national, uh, that natural growth. Uh, uh, land is also taken and forests are planted, little uh, forests here and there, a lot of them funded by uh, people around the world that think that they are planting a tree in the Holy Land. And uh, uh, so national parks, the construction of colonies, the construction of settler roads, colonial roads that connect the settlements, connect the settlements around the West Bank to Jerusalem and to each other. Many of these colonial roads also happen to be sitting mostly on Palestinian privately owned land that was confiscated from its owners. 
So land confiscation as a dispossession is a very effective tool of displacement against the Palestinian presence in the city. And it works hand in hand with home demolition. The home demolition policy is very active in Jerusalem and Palestinian homes, Palestinian shops, Palestinian agricultural structures are demolished all the time with the excuse that they were built illegally without permits. Now, when we have land, a little bit of land left, and we would like to build on it, naturally, again, not only in Palestine, everywhere, you cannot simply build freely on your land. You need to go to the authorities, the, plan, the, the, the planning committees need to authorize your construction, and it has to fit an existing master plan. But since our master plans are not developed, it is used as an excuse to reject our applications for building permits. In the last six years, the Israeli authorities rejected 94% of our applications for building permits. So I think it is safe to say that the Israeli occupation does not allow us to build legally, leaving us with only one of two options. We either build illegally or we leave the city. And I am proud to say that for the Palestinians in Jerusalem, it is very important to stay, stand their grounds and stick to their city. I mean, I think Palestinians in general have this. And so many Palestinians choose to build illegally, risk the house being demolished. And I, I suppose the next question would be, but if you know the house will be demolished, why do you build it illegally anyway? And the simple answer to that is we just take a risk we gamble, we build the house, and we hope that it will stand as long as possible, that we will get to live in it as long as possible before it is demolished. When the Israeli authorities uh, spot new constructions, usually the, the family that built the house receives the first notice. The first notice will say, you built illegally, now you have to go and retroactively legalize the new, the new construction. In the meantime, you have to pay a fine. These are very high fines, I have to say. Many Palestinian families do not have the means to pay that illegal construction fine. Nonetheless, they do it. Usually, of course, they need to hire a lawyer so that the lawyer can follow up on the process and the procedure of legalizing retroactively uh, 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 it's needless to say that in the vast majority, if not all cases, we do not get to retroactively legalize that construction because if the Israeli occupation wanted to give us those permits, they would have granted us the permits in the first place. And so you pay lots of money as a fine or as a, a lawyer fees, and then you fail to legalize your construction and you receive the next notice. The next notice says, you either demolish this house or we come demolish it for you. And many people decide to demolish their own homes. I mean, both scenarios are simply horrible uh, scenarios. And people order a bulldozer or bring the tools and they demolish the new construction. That can be either a big full house or a, an additional floor or an additional room sometimes. Some people don't even have space to build new homes, but what they do is add another bedroom and another bathroom to the newly wedded son and his wife so that they can live in the same place and not have to leave the city. And sometimes you have to uh, demolish that addition or the new house that you have built. If you decide not to do it on your own, then the Israeli authorities will send their bulldozers and the bulldozers will come accompanied with police forces, with a police force. The police force will create a circle around your house, they will knock at your door and they will say you have 20 minutes to be outside. In 20 minutes we will demolish this house. And then people have to take their kids, some of their clothes, maybe some other stuff they manage to, to save, and they stand outside and watch their house being demolished, and then they leave and send us the bills. And we have to cover the expenses of our own home demolitions, even though the Israeli authorities do have, the municipality does have a, an annual budget for covering the expenses of demolitions of illegal constructions. Nonetheless, in the case of Palestinian illegal constructions, they do not cover those, those expenses. They save the money and they make the Palestinians pay it, double gain. And then the Palestinian families find themselves 
not only homeless, but also bankrupt in the awfully expensive city of Jerusalem because they used up all life savings in order to build the house. And then they used up all favors from family and friends to cover the expenses of fines or lawyers or demolitions. The whole experience can cost a Palestinian family up to one million shekels. This is a huge amount of money to, an very, to a very poor population. The Palestinian population in Jerusalem is awfully poor. 80 percent of the population lives below the official poverty line. And so a family eventually finds itself bankrupt and homeless in Jerusalem, and many of them have to leave the city in order to find that available or affordable housing outside. There are not very clear numbers when it comes to home demolitions in Jerusalem, but the estimated number of structures in general demolished in, in Jerusalem since 1967 is 5,000. Out of these, 2,000 are estimated to be homes. The other structures could be agricultural, again, or business structures. Either way, Palestinian construction is not allowed. I mean, other Smaller problems exist as well. For example, Palestinians cannot build higher than five floors. And so you cannot even build uh, uh, vertically, not only grow horizontally, but also growing higher is forbidden for Palestinians in, in Jerusalem. Other planning policies include the creation and construction of colonies and settlements. Today, there are 214,000 settlers living in the eastern part of Jerusalem alone, out of 650,000 who live in the West Bank in total. These settlers live in settlements that were built around our neighborhoods in the beginning, when the eastern part of the city was occupied, what the Israeli occupation started doing is build settlements uh, around the old city, a ring around the old city from the eastern side, so that they could put facts on the ground. So the Israeli uh, control crawling down east so that, that the land uh, would never be uh, returned under any uh, imaginary future scenarios, and then in, in, in the mid-90s, a new phenomenon started when the discussion became one of a two-state solution, two capitals, the, the city of Jerusalem divided into two cities, two capitals of two states. That is when those settlements started being built in the heart of our neighborhoods. And now it is, they are located in almost every single Palestinian neighborhood east of the old city. Of course, inside the old city as well. In addition to land confiscation, home demolition, and the construction of colonies, there is the intentional underdevelopment of infrastructures in our communities. Uh, in order for the communities to grow strong, in order for those communities to actually survive, but also flourish and be uh, 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 vibrant, we need uh, infrastructures. We need streets, we need uh, uh, sidewalks, we need bus stops, we need medical centers and business centers, schools and other needs, parks also, that we lack severely in the city of Jerusalem. There is an intentional underdevelopment in order to stop the Palestinian community from uh, becoming a vibrant one, one uh, an alive uh, uh, society in, in the city of Jerusalem. Of course, infrastructure for settlements, infrastructure for connecting those settlements does exist. Infrastructure of tourism does exist in our communities, but not infrastructure for our own development or for our own gain from this tourism, as I will be explaining in a few minutes. In addition to that, another big effective tool of, of oppression, displacement, and colonization in Jerusalem is the suffocation of the Palestinian economy, preventing economic development in the city of Jerusalem. Since the beginning of the occupation, since 1967, uh, uh, the Israeli plan has been to isolate Jerusalem from the rest of the West Bank, cutting off ties between the city and its surroundings. Jerusalem up till then was the center for its surrounding and neighboring towns. Uh, the, the small then town of Ramallah, the small town of Bethlehem, the city of Jericho, uh, they all had ties to Jerusalem after the, the ties to the west to, to, <clears throat> to Jaffa were cut off in 1948. But the three other sides, that connection was cut off uh, following 67 and the 1967 occupation. And 
in order to uh, uh, isolate the city, in addition to the physical isolation, which uh, uh, came in the shape of, if you look at the first line, the borders, the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem, or the construction of the annexation and expansion wall in 2003, that started in 2003. There is also the economic isolation of Jerusalem, cutting off ties that are not only political, cultural, or social, but also economic between Jerusalem and its surroundings. And the <clears throat> The municipal boundaries followed by the military checkpoints followed by the annexation and expansion wall, they all physically cut off those economic ties. They cut off the flow of goods and customers in and out of Jerusalem. And suddenly, the villages around the city that used to come to their urban center to shop for their needs, but also to sell their products, their harvest and their, uh, for example, the farming communities used to come sell their very delicious fruit and vegetables in Jerusalem and the Bedouin communities used to come sell their wool and their products in the, in the market of Jerusalem, buy the things they need from the city and this flow of goods and customer is almost entirely cut off today. And the construction of the wall was certainly the biggest factor recently of suffocating the Palestinian economy. With the construction of the wall, many of the Palestinian uh, businesses in Jerusalem lost their customers and they had to shut down. Hundreds of Palestinian businesses shut down in the city of Jerusalem since the construction of the wall started almost 19 years ago. Other areas where the Israeli occupation uh, 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 applies displacement are uh, education, for example. In 1967, when the Israeli authorities uh, occupied the eastern part of the city, they imposed their own Israeli curriculum on the Palestinian schools in Jerusalem, on the public schools in Jerusalem. And please note that when I say the Israeli curriculum, I am not saying that this is the same curriculum that is made and prepared for Israeli Jewish schools, but this is a special curriculum created by the colonizer to educate the colonized, to brainwash the colonized, to create a certain new state of mind. Just as a, a small anecdote and example, if you take the book that is made, uh, the, the title of the book is To Be Citizens in Israel, and it is a book and a, les a lesson that teaches you how to be a good citizen of Israel. So it uh, introduces on one of the first pages the symbols of the state. So there is the Star of David as the symbol of our country and there is the police symbol, the logo of the Israeli occupation police as our security forces. So this is just one example, very simple, of what that curriculum means. The curriculum certainly is just part uh, of the settler colonialist system that wants to replace one people with another, that wants to replace one history and narrative and language with another, and certainly it is uh, uh, very effectively or could very effectively be done through education and imposing the Israeli curriculum. Just to give you a short, uh, uh, hopeful story, in 1967, the, the Israeli occupation did impose that curriculum on all public Palestinian schools in the city of Jerusalem. And then it started a huge wave of boycott and protest. And the Palestinian families stopped sending their kids to public schools that uh, uh, adopted or were given, against their will, the Israeli curriculum. And this boycott was very effective. Families that uh, uh, sent their kids outside of the city to go study in nearby uh, 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 towns and villages so that they don't have to learn the colonizer narrative. In addition, some educators joined forces with some, uh, uh, um, how should I call them, capital holders, rich people, and they created alternative schools. They created Palestinian private schools that stuck to the, back then it was the Jordanian curriculum because the West Bank was under Jordanian control between 48 and 67. The Palestinian Authority had not existed back then, so there was no real Palestinian curriculum, but there was the Jordanian curriculum, and so these alternative schools were the refuge for all of those kids 
and their families that did not want to send their kids to uh, 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 Israeli uh, schools or Israeli dominated schools. The boycott was so effective and so long. It lasted for seven years. And in 1974, eventually the Israeli occupation backed off and they said, okay, you can have the Jordanian uh, uh, curriculum back. But I had to say that since then they have been trying to find alternative ways to impose their curriculum on the Palestinian schools when they saw that this uh, 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 um, uh, forcing of the curriculum did not work back then. They started looking for uh, uh, indirect ways to do it, and today it is done by preventing budgets from the schools. Palestinian schools in Jerusalem being under occupation, they need budgets, they have to get budgets from the occupier. The Israeli occupation authorities are obliged to provide those uh, 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 funds to the Palestinian schools. And when a Palestinian school demands the smallest budgets, they can be budgets for fixing chairs and broken desks, they can be budgets for buying uh, markers for the boards, boards or even uh, buying footballs and, and basketballs, then the Israeli uh, occupation authorities answer is always use our curriculum we'll give you that budget you don't use our cur curriculum we will not give you that budget and so more schools are having to accept it in order for them to survive so there is the big problem of the curriculum, which for the Palestinians is the most serious one, but there is also the problem of, no, uh, uh, of the lack of schools, the, 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 the physical lack of schools and classrooms for Palestinian kids in Jerusalem. Today, it is the number of missing classrooms is estimated at 2,000 or more than 2,000 classrooms, which means that tens of thousands of Palestinian kids do not have public schools to go to at the beginning of every school year leaving their families usually with one of two options. They either send them to private schools in Jerusalem, and private schools are awfully expensive, with 80% poverty rates. Many or most Palestinian families cannot afford private schools. And then the only other choice would be sending their kids to schools outside of Jerusalem, and then remember that is used as an excuse to say, you cannot hold that permanent residency permit. You sent your kids outside, so they, their center of life is not Jerusalem. And so it is used just like forcing people to move and live outside of Jerusalem because there isn't any available or affordable housing inside, just like sending people out because there aren't enough hospitals in Jerusalem and so on. Usually these policies work together and they eventually lead to the same inevitable result. More and more Palestinians displaced from Jerusalem. So it's not just the physical aggressive displacement. There is also a silent, subtle, still very violent and aggressive displacement pushing Palestinians outside of the city to look for their very basic daily life needs. So these are many areas where you can see the colonization in, in Jerusalem. One area that people tend to not notice or maybe not think about as an area where the colonization is also applied and displacement is also applied is tourism. And this is the focus of uh, uh, the next part of this uh, uh, presentation. Jerusalem, the holy city, is a top tourist attra attraction and destination. Millions of people come to visit Jerusalem every year. Millions of people come to visit the holy city not knowing how unholy the situation is in the holy city. And just to give you some numbers, there is an ongoing continuous growth in the numbers of tourists arriving into Jerusalem. In 2016, that growth of inbound tourism was 47%, the growth. And uh, uh, the number estimated in 2017 was 2.8. 2.8 million tourists visited Jerusalem in 2017. Uh, I just saw a recent report that said that in 2018, I think it was, it was certainly above 3 million. I think it was around 3.6 million tourists who came to Jerusalem. But due to the Israeli uh, uh, policies in Jerusalem, many of these tourists do not know the political reality of Jerusalem and do not meet the Palestinians in Jerusalem. The, 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 the eastern part of the city is entirely hidden from their experience as visitors. <clears throat> in, in 2016, only 20% of the tourists who stayed overnight in Jerusalem stayed in Palestinian hotels. 
And this is not only due to the lack of hotel rooms, but there is a severe lack in hotel rooms, just like the building of homes and of businesses and of parks and infrastructure. Also, the construction of Palestinian hotels is limited and not allowed freely in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, the numbers today stand at 1,500 hotel rooms, Palestinian hotel rooms, versus 20,000 Israeli hotel rooms in the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> but not only the infrastructure is lacking, also the Israeli propaganda hides away the eastern part of the city. So <clears throat> when Israeli, <clears throat> excuse me, when Israeli tourist agencies uh, uh, plan a program for a group or a, a tourist, <clears throat> then they do not include a visit to the eastern part of the city. The Israeli maps marginalize the eastern part of the city. We will look at one example of an Israeli map of Jerusalem, and uh, 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 they prevent the visit from the tourists, tourists who don't know better about the, the situation in Jerusalem or about the political reality in Jerusalem or the shape of Jerusalem can easily visit the city, enjoy their time, and leave without even knowing that there is an occupation. Uh, uh, if we look at Israeli maps, for example, we will see that huge parts of the eastern part of occupied Jerusalem are not even on the map that is given to tourists. Um, uh, if you look at uh, Israeli pamphlets or advertisements, then you will see that they highlight a certain narrative and not the other, a certain history and not the other. And usually, of course, the Jewish history in Jerusalem is used to justify the displacement of Palestinians the confiscation of land, the demolition of homes. Uh, one of the national parks existing in Jerusalem today is called the City of David, uh, as in King David. This City of David Park and Visitor Center is located in Silwan, which is the Palestinian neighborhood, the big Palestinian neighborhood just south of the, of the old city, just outside of Dun Gate. And this visit visitor center and national park is the only Israeli national park that is managed by a settler organization. The notorious El Ad, which is in charge of evicting Palestinian, homes for, uh, Palestinian families from their homes in Silwan, moving settlers in, El Ad uh, runs a visitor center that provides the Zionist narrative of Jerusalem, and it is part of the tourist experience when they come to, to, to the city of Jerusalem. El Ad, for example, also provides tours of Jerusalem, so you can go to the city of David uh, 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 Settler uh, National Park, and from there, after you receive the whole story, you can go and see it and follow the line and follow the history of King David and his adventures in Jerusalem, and then you visit the, 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 not only the, 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 the settlements, not only the national park, but also the settlements in the eastern part of, of Jerusalem. Before I share a little bit more about uh, uh, Israeli uh, uh, plans when it comes to, to tourism in Jerusalem and how these plans support colonial expansion and displacement of Palestinians, I would like to share with you one example of the Israeli propaganda when it comes to, to Jerusalem. There is a, an advertisement here for Jerusalem. Everything here is so connected and so together. It's like as if everything combines together into this beautiful harmony. Like Jews and Arabs and tourists from all over the world, like Chinese and Australians, all together. Something that you cannot find anywhere else. When we, we walk in Jerusalem, we, we feel the story comes alive. Two thousand years ago, uh, the people there uh, walked there around, and Jesus walked there around, and now we walk around here. It's, it's very special. I 
feel the sky is a bit closer. I feel um, that it's not just a story from the history books, but it's real and it's alive and I'm a part of it. Okay, so I guess I don't need to interpret a lot, a lot what we just uh, watched. Uh, clearly, the whole city is together. All uh, uh, residents are together, Jews and Arabs and, and tourists, all walking the path of G Jesus and uh, enjoying uh, 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 the beautiful city, the city beyond belief. Uh, and this is just one example of, of the Israeli propaganda that is very misleading, that hides the actual political reality. And uh, uh, you could see very clearly the old city and the old city uh, streets in this advertisement. And of course, the old city is the, the, the main destination for many, many tourists when they come to visit Jerusalem. And uh, uh, um, there is no mention, or at, of course not, but uh, for the, the, the old city at least being recognized as a occupied territory by, uh, by the international law, uh, which is uh, another thing I would love to talk about a little bit maybe in our discussion later. So this is just an example of, of Israeli advertisements. And so here is one of the Israeli maps made for Jerusalem. You can find it on the Israeli Occupations Municipality website. And uh, you probably can find it also in different hotel lobbies when you come visit Jerusalem. And uh, uh, for those who are not, who are not familiar with, with Jerusalem and, and the way Jerusalem looks, this is the old city. This uh, 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 semi-square uh, structure, uh, shape, this is the old city of Jerusalem. This is the original heart of the city, the city center. But as you can see, it doesn't look like it's the city center. It is marginalized, pushed to the right, while the city center on this map is where the Israeli parliament is. It's the heart of the western occupied part of Jerusalem, where the Israeli parliament is, where the Israeli uh, uh, national theater is, and that is marketed to the tourists as the city center. So any tourist who doesn't know better, again, doesn't have an awareness about the shape of the city or the different parts of the city or the occupation in the city will probably think that this is where they need to focus their visit in Jerusalem. Whenever I go to different cities around the world, I hold the map that is given to me and I look at it and based on it, I decide where I need to go and what I need to see and visit. And the tourist that receives this map will think that beyond the old city there is nothing to the east that they have to go look for but there is a huge part of the city that that is not even on this map that is deleted from this map in addition maybe you can see how there is more life on the left than over here for example and many Palestinians live in this area, but they, it is marketed as empty, as dull, as there is nothing for you to see there. And so the Israeli maps in general follow, of course, the certain Israeli political uh, propaganda and narrative. They omit and delete parts of the city from the map itself. And those parts that are lucky enough to be on the map, the Palestinian neighborhoods, they look empty as if there is nothing for you to go see there. So Israeli maps, of course, are just another tool of uh, spreading this narrative and this propaganda about the city. Of course, notice please that TripAdvisor logo on the corner in the left. We will be talking a little bit about international complicity uh, in a few minutes. But still, let's focus a bit more about Israeli plans for Jerusalem and how tourism is used as another tool to advance them in the city. In, in, in Jerusalem, the, 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 the tourist uh, experience is connected to the uh, colonial expansion. So not only having settler organizations run visitor centers and national parks and provide very Zionist and very specific narrative tours in the city, but also uh, uh, there are different projects in Jerusalem that exist or are being uh, uh, implemented and built that strengthen the connection between the settlements and tourism. 
So for example, a new project that was recently uh, uh, advertised or uh, uncovered in a few months ago is a project to build a cable car in Jerusalem. And this cable car is going to begin in uh, the German colony near the neighborhood of El Qatamon, there in the southwestern side of the city. It will take tourists from the west to the east. The first stop will be just outside of the city of David National Park, just outside the uh, Al Burak Wall, which is known as the Western Wall, which the Israelis call the Wailing Wall. And so the, the attractions around the first stop will be going to Al Burak Wall Plaza, where we saw people uh, 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 pray in that, uh, in that advertisement, a place that until 1967 was home to uh, almost a thousand Palestinian families. Palestinian homes were demolished immediately following the, wall, uh, the war in 67 in order to clear this plaza. And uh, um, from there, the, the, the tourists can take the cable car again and go up the Mount of Olives another big tourist attraction, especially for pilgrims and religious tourists. And there, and also secular tourists, of course, they want to see the, the Mount of Olives. So the cable car will take them up that hill and put them, the next stop will be just outside of the settlement of Ma'alei Hazitim. Ma'alei Hazitim is a settlement in the heart of Ras Al Amud, a Palestinian neighborhood that is on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. From there, they can go into the Jewish cemetery that is on the slopes of the Mount of Olives, a very ancient cemetery and a very big cemetery on the slope of, of the mountain. And there, Israel uh, and the Israeli occupation authorities will be building a visitor center and uh, uh, creating a promenade, a path for tourists to walk from the cemetery up the Mount of Olives to the top of the Mount of Olives. This promenade will take them from just in front of Ma'alei Hazitim settlement or colony all the way up to the next colony in, uh, on the Mount of Olives, Beit Ha'orot or the House of Lights, which is uh, another colony uh, located on top of the Mount of Olives. This way, the whole experience of tourists will be just jumping from one settler uh, project to another. This is the first gain. For, for the Israeli occupation. They follow the narrative and they hear the narrative everywhere they go. At the same time, this means that these tourists will not be walking down the streets of a tour, the Palestinian community on the top of the Mount of Olives. And so the, 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 the Palestinian communities on all, this, uh, all through this path will be hidden and omitted from the uh, uh, tourists' uh, experience in, in Jerusalem. Um, uh, in addition to the infrastructure, I'm sorry because I cannot see it anymore. In addition to the, to the infrastructure, there are also a lot of festivals and international sport events and music events that take place in Jerusalem, that Israel uh, organizes in Jerusalem in order to attract tourists. So for example, I don't know if you noticed during the video, there were, there were shots of the Israeli Jerusalem Marathon, which has become a big uh, 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 festive event where many tourists come to run the marathon or witness the marathon in Jerusalem, a marathon that also runs between east and west, uh, uh, again representing the Israeli control over the whole city. In addition, uh, some uh, festivals take place in Jerusalem, for example, the Festival of Lights. This is a festival that doesn't take place only in Jerusalem. Other cities around the world have their own lights festival, like New York or Amsterdam, and also Jerusalem. So Israel trying to enter this global sphere where they also become another normal city hosting another global festival and event. In addition, some sport events take place in Jerusalem that are also uh, 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 global or international. For example, the Italian bicycle competition known as Giro d'Italia. The Giro d'Italia uh, uh, is probably the biggest cycling uh, competition in, in Italy. It has never taken place outside of Europe. It took place in some European cities, but never outside Europe until last year. And guess where it was outside of Europe for the first time? 
Jerusalem. And so people came to witness and to enjoy and to participate in this big sport happening that was hosted by the occupation state and was another way of Israel again marketing Jerusalem as its own and by action also gaining a lot of uh, 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 support politically and economically. And then there is the Israeli propaganda, and there are the international companies and the international en uh, engines and booking agencies that follow the Israeli propaganda very loyally, and they uh, uh, adopt it fully. We saw the uh, uh, logo of Trip, uh, Trip Advisor on, on, on the map. Uh, you might have heard about some campaigning and mobilization that was happening against Booking.com and Airbnb for listing properties that are uh, owned by settlers in the occupied 67 territories. Uh, uh, the campaign about Airbnb took a lot uh, of, of uh, uh, attention and Airbnb had to uh, release a statement. They stated that uh, they are going to take away and delete the listings of, of properties in Israeli settlements in the West Bank, but not in Jerusalem. Since the beginning, say, they said, we are not going to delete any listings uh, uh, in Jerusalem, in the eastern part of Jerusalem. Nonetheless, they did not omit anything. They did not delete anything, not in Jerusalem nor in the West Bank. And still, you can go on Airbnb and rent your settlement house for your next visit in Palestine if you like. In addition, Google is another big supporter of the Israeli uh, uh, narrative and propaganda. So uh, uh, two things and two examples about Google that you can test out for yourselves. First of all, a few months ago, Google moved the city center from the old city to the same place you saw the city center on the Israeli map. So today, the city center of Jerusalem on Google Maps is not where the old city is, where the original city center is, but rather way more west to the west. In addition, Google as a search engine supports the Israeli uh, exist, uh, existence control and economy in the eastern part of Jerusalem. So for example, and in the west of course, if you try to look up a business in the eastern part of Jerusalem, say hairdresser East Jerusalem, then notice, note the results that you will get. You will get many results taking you to hairdressers in the west, in the western part of, of Jerusalem, or to uh, Israeli hairdressers in the east, so in settlements. Maybe you will find some Palestinian results, but they will be down the list. They will not even appear among the first results that you will get. Needless to say, many people do not even, I don't go down on the list when I look up anything on Google. And so you will be directed by Google and by Google search engine and Google Maps uh, to support Israeli economy in, in Jerusalem and not Palestinian economy, even if you are awarely, intentionally looking for it. This has many effects on us, the Palestinians. On the one hand, politically, many tourists do not see us. They do not see the occupation in our communities. They don't, they don't see the physical displacement. They don't see the oppression. They don't see the home demolitions. They don't see the police and army terrorizing the people, humiliating the people in the streets every day. They don't see the lack of infrastructure. They don't see any of those uh, effects of colonization and occupation in Jerusalem. In addition, this has an economic effect, of course, on the Palestinian people. So the tourists do not see us. They don't come to our uh, uh, neighborhoods. They don't stay in our hotels. They don't eat in our restaurants. They don't shop in our markets. They don't come buy tickets at our festivals. And so they do not spend any money. They do not invest any money in the Palestinian economy in Jerusalem. And tourism is the main engine of our economy in Jerusalem, 40% of the Palestinian Palestinian economy in the city is tourism, is income from tourism. And with only 20% staying in our neighborhoods and uh, spending their money in our neighborhoods, you can imagine what a huge effect this has on the Palestinian economy in the city. But on top of the political and economic results, there is just the general 
sad result of millions of people missing a lot of fun in Jerusalem because of that. They don't come to see the beautiful places we have. They don't know where they can hike in the eastern part of Jerusalem. They don't know what cooperatives they can visit, souvenirs they can buy, hostels and hotels they can stay in, and so the, and, and, and festivals that we have that they never hear about. For example, there is this beautiful village in the uh, uh, south of Jerusalem called Battir. Battir is known for its eggplants. Battir produces the best eggplants in Palestine and they have their annual eggplant festival and certainly no Israeli tour guide and no Israeli website and no Israeli map is going to tell you about all of these attractions. So as a result, the whole experience is lacking just like the, 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 the political and economic effect, there is also just the general effect of people missing out, missing out a lot. And that is exactly why we created wujud. Wujud, again, is Arabic for existence, presence, to say that there is Palestinian existence and presence in Jerusalem, and to invite people to come to our communities. Wujud, uh, Wujud's uh, version that we have here is the second edition of, of the book. The first edition was uh, uh, published in 2014, and we have just published the second edition. I will take you uh, 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 through Wujud and just tell you what Wujud uh, as a Palestinian grassroots guide to Jerusalem offers you as visitors to our city. The first chapter is the uh, chapter that is not only relevant when you come, it is also relevant before you come because many people plan their trips before they leave the house. So they know which hotel they're going to stay in. They know which activities they are going to have. They might have an idea about which food to eat and what souvenirs to buy already before they come to the city. And so that the first chapter of Wujud that is titled While in the City also works before you are in the city. And it provides that tourist practical tourist, tourist information about Palestinian hotels and guest houses and hostels that you can sleep at. It has a whole list of the Palestinian hotels that are located in, in Jerusalem at least around the main uh, city center, the original uh, city center. In addition, it has lists of restaurants or food and drink areas around uh, uh, Jerusalem, in addition to shopping areas and markets, not only in the, in the old city, also outside of the old city, streets like Salah al-Din and the Zahra, Nabi Suleiman, uh, 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 sorry, Sultan Sliman and also Nablus Road. All of these are vibrant economic streets and, and centers where people can find a lot of things uh, 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 to buy. Uh, in addition, it also has information about transportation. In Jerusalem, there are two totally uh, disconnected uh, uh, tra public transportation systems. The Israeli uh, public transportation system does not take you anywhere in Palestinian neighborhoods unless it is to an, an Israeli colony inside those neighborhoods. So for example, there is no Israeli bus that takes you from, say, Jaffa Road in the west to Jabal al mukabbar in the east, in the southeast. But there is one bus line that can take you to the colony of North Zion in the heart of Jabal al mukabbar So there is no bus to Palestinian neighborhoods. There are buses to, Pal to Israeli set settlements in these neighborhoods. As a result, the Palestinians had to create their own public transportation system. And we have our own buses going to our own neighborhoods. And so we included in Wujud, it comes also on the map that is with Wujud, a whole, uh, 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 the whole list of lines and destinations of pal Palestinian buses because we tell you what you can see in the city. We also need to tell you how you can make it there. In addition, there is other uh, practical information like what do you do in a medical uh, emergency, for example, or how or, and where you can learn Arabic if you're st staying for a longer time. If you're staying for a shorter time, there is a list of basic words and sentences that you might need in order to find your way or uh, uh, buy something in, in the market. So all of this is found in the chapter that is called While in Jerusalem. Next comes the chapter that tells the political context. Again, 
being a tourist in Jerusalem is political and uh, uh, there is nothing no, nothing like being a, a neutral visitor in Jerusalem and we think that we need to provide this political context to all of these visitors that do not know about the political reality in the city and that might have no exposure to what's happening in the city. So in the story of the city, we provide, first of all, hello, come on in. We provide the history, and the history in this chapter is actually wider than Jerusalem. It provides the story of Zionism in Palestine and how the Zionist project in Palestine started, and our history with our previous colonizer, the British colon colonial rule in Palestine, and how it supported the, 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 the settler colonialist Zionist system to be in place. And in addition, we tell the stories of the Nakba and, uh, uh, of course, of 1967 and what happened in Jerusalem then we focus on Jerusalem and talk about all of these different policies I was just explaining about so what is the political reality for Palestinians in the city so that people can understand into what they are uh, 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 going to, to into what city in addition we talk about International aid, which is another part of the problem, as I started saying earlier, many people think that international aid to Palestine is just a tool to help Palestinian liberation and freedom and self-determination, but I hate to bring it to you, it is not. It is just another layer of colonization, it's another layer of occupation that we believe at grassroots Al-Quds that we need to break free out of as Palestinians. International aid, uh, uh, just in a few words, is uh, 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 simply an extension of colonialism. It's an extension of the physical colonialism that existed in many, uh, in, in, in the region, in, in many countries around us, and uh, international aid is provided to those developing countries, uh, we prefer to call them formerly colonized countries, uh, and international aid comes with many, many strings attached. International aid comes with dictated agendas. No one would provide aid to the Palestinians or any other people, not no one, but most uh, aid providers usually come with their own perception of what our liberation should look like and what our advocacy should sound like and what development in our communities should look like. They don't come knowing their place and asking, how can we help you? They come and say, I know what you need, thinking in their own very white, western, arrogant way that they know better than the Palestinians what is good for the Palestinians, that they know how we can liberate ourselves better than us, that they know better than Jerusalemites what Jerusalem needs or any other city for that matter. So first of all, there is the political problem, the agenda problem, because usually there is a discrepancy between my vision as a Palestinian and the vision of my donor or United Nations agencies or international NGOs that come and implement projects in our uh, uh, communities. In addition, international aid is, is uh, um, uh, uh, another means or income generation tool. It makes money for uh, uh, aid providers. They make income from providing aid. Uh, for example, when it comes to donor countries, uh, for each one dollar spent uh, uh, in international aid, they get two in return. So it's a very profitable business, international aid. But in uh, uh, short, I, I, I don't want to speak too much about international aid, but as, as a result, this usually means that we, the Palestinians, uh, uh, do not grow, we do not develop with international aid. International aid does not, in its existing shape and system, does not allow us to do accumulative work, does not allow us to do any sustainable work, and it only helps itself stay in the game. It, help, it keeps us dependent on it. And that is a very big problem for a people who would like to end an occupation and to uh, uh, practice uh, freedom and self-determination. So this was a big uh, uh, side note about another part of this chapter in Wujud that talks about international aid. And it's very important for us to provide it as part of the political story of Jerusalem, because in Jerusalem there isn't just the occupation, there is also the international occupation and colonization. And that's exactly why we finally talk about BDS, and we think that BDS is another very important topic to provide as part of our political story. Uh, uh, we witness also how more and 
more, it's becoming more sensitive to talk about BDS. And uh, uh, you mentioned BDS and many people start becoming uncomfortable in their seats. And that is exactly why we thought it was very important to talk about it as a very legitimate and powerful tool of resistance. And uh, we talk about the reasons behind our call for BDS and uh, how people can help with boycotting, divesting, and imposing sanctions on, on the Israeli uh, occupation and its behavior in, in Palestine and in Jerusalem in general. So this is the chapter that talks about all of these uh, uh, parts of our political reality that we think are important when you are visiting Jerusalem that you understand. Next comes the very uh, uh, exciting part uh, uh, for many of us. It is the story of the communities. It is the people of the city. So who are the Palestinians in Jerusalem? What are their stories? Where do they live? And what is there to see and hear and watch in their uh, uh, own neighborhoods, villages, and, and two refugee camps as well? So there. We uh, provide that story that we have gathered from the communities themselves and from researching these communities. So we both provide the, the political reality, but also what, are, what is there for tourists to see. So if there are hikes or uh, activities to, to, to do, if there are tours to take, and not only political tours, but any tours, Palestinian tours, uh, if there are places to stay, if you can, I mean, you can also attend the festival in Battir and also sleep in the guest house in Battir. So these are all, uh, uh, this is all information provided uh, in, in this chapter that tells the community stories, it tells about the tourist attractions in them, and also grassroots movements and uh, organizations that welcome guests, where you can go and uh, receive presentations, hear presentations, or again take tours, or have lunch, and buy souvenirs. So these uh, 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 locations are also mentioned with e within each community story. Next comes the chapter called Around Palestine that provides the same information but on a much smaller scale for other Palestinian cities. So how can you be an ethical and responsible tourist when you go to Haifa, when you go to Akka and Nazareth and Jenin and Jericho and Nablus and Hebron, Naqab, but also in the occupied Syria and Golan Heights. So, we provide the same information, uh, uh, again, in a much smaller scale, but a little bit of the reality in these cities, but also attractions and places to visit and people to meet in these locations, how you can stay in Palestinian hotels and hostels if they exist, or other alternative uh, uh, accommodation possibilities. In addition, how you can support the Palestinian steadfastness and economy in these cities by, again, supporting the Palestinian uh, businesses in them. And regarding maybe just a few words about the occupied Syrian Golan Heights, uh, it is a Syrian territory and it is under Israeli occupation since 1967. And even though it's not Palestine, and we make a, a, a very important clarification there that we do not consider it part of Palestine, but we know also that many tourists go there and there's the, the only way to access the Golan Heights is through Palestine. And so you cannot go visit Syria and from there enter the Golan Heights because the, the border is between Syria and the Golan Heights. And so we tell people how they can go there and hear the Syrian narrative, how they can stay in Syrian guest houses and not in Israeli settlements in the Golan Heights, how they can eat in Syrian restaurants and how they can support the, again, the steadfastness and the economy of the Syrian people in the Golan Heights. In addition to these chapters, we uh, uh, included many Palestinian maps in, 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 in the book, uh, including this, if I just may show the, the map, the map of Jerusalem that we so arrogantly call the real map of Jerusalem because we think that it does show the whole city. So I don't know if you could see it from here, but this is the map of Jerusalem that comes with, with the book showing the whole city, not limited to west, or only parts of the Big East. And as you can see, the old city is more in its natural position, more closer to the center. But then on the other side of this map that provides a lot of the political story as well, you can see the different lines, you can see the municipal boundaries, you can see the wall, but also 
the other side will provide you with some navigation maps. So how you can walk around and inside the old city and how you can find uh, uh, your way inside those uh, uh, Palestinian communities. In addition, we at Grassroots Al-Quds use a very specific terminology. We believe that terminology is very important. And so, uh, uh, for example, instead of saying East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, we say the eastern part and the western part of occupied Jerusalem. And we found that there is a need to explain our terminology in the book. So there is a glossary with some of those terms that we use in, in, in wujud that we thought there is a need also to explain why we choose them and why we use them. In addition, you have some uh, uh, recommended readings and films because you can never learn enough about Palestine and uh, wujud as big as it is, it's a 400 page book, but nonetheless, we have a lot more to say and uh, we think that there is a lot more to, to learn uh, uh, about Palestine and about Jerusalem. So we included a whole list of books and articles and films to read and watch about Jerusalem and Palestine in general. There is also the references of all of the stories and the, the analysis that we provide so you can always uh, if you find one topic interesting can go to the source where we took that information from and read more about that uh, 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 theme or that topic uh, that's that's what we have in 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 wujud i will finish and end just with a big thank you for listening to my very long uh, uh, presentation and being uh, uh, kind enough with the te technical problems we've been having and uh, you can follow us and visit our website so you can learn a bit more about us as an organization as well as about Jerusalem. So on our website, grassrootsalquds.net, you can find all of those community stories and community organization and grassroots movements profiles as well as our maps and uh, our political analysis about the reality in Jerusalem. And you can also follow us on social media, our Facebook page, our Twitter account, and also our very brand new Instagram account. Thank you very much for listening. I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. I am very happy you're asking this question also because I forgot to mention that the plan was never adopted officially. Even though the plan was put in place, the plan was never deposited for a public review, which is the democratic procedure you need to take when you create such a plan, you present it to the residents of the city, they comment on it, they object on it, and then you uh, edit it accordingly so that you can actually say it was decided upon in a democratic manner. But this did not happen with this plan. Nonetheless, it continued being the background of so many other plans and policies to follow. Uh, but to your uh, uh, direct question, there are many other plans for Jerusalem. And I would say that the, the most important one today is Jerusalem 2050, which talks about the vision for Jerusalem in 2050. And it focuses on turning Jerusalem into a huge, vibrant business hub. So now there are infrastructure being put in, in, place, uh, put in place to create a business district uh, uh, right at the western entrance to Jerusalem, so very strategically also uh, located uh, uh, immediately when you arrive from the center, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, making it much more, first of all, compelling for businesses to be located in Jerusalem. So again, uh, bringing more, not only Israeli residents, but also uh, businesses into the city. And um, uh, so this is just one example of other plans that exist for Jerusalem. Uh, there, uh, the, the 
Israeli occupation never wastes time and never waits until the last minute. There is also another big master plan that is always in the background and was a bit actually in the front lately, earlier this year, and that is the Greater Jerusalem Metropolis master plan. The Greater Jerusalem Metropolis is a plan to expand the Jerusalem municipal boundaries very far away, very much far away, all the way up north to include the Giv'on settlement block near Giv'at Ze'ev, which is actually west of Ramallah, to go all the way down east to include Ma'ale Adumim, which is a colony and settlement built halfway through to the Dead Sea and Jericho, so uh, almost towards the end of, of, of the West Bank from the Jordanian side, and then to go and stretch it south to uh, to Hebron, and to, inglu- to include the Gush Etzion or the Etzion settlement block around and inside Hebron in the Jerusalem municipal boundaries. So expanding the municipal boundaries so much, so enormously, at the same time, just uh, uh, surgically we say, like like, like a, sur- a surgeon, leaving Palestinian communities out. So the, the, the line is going to be just just like the wall today as well. It's, it's a snake that just goes in and out, adding and annexing what Israel wants and uh, disconnecting and isolating what Israel does not. So the, the Greater Jerusalem Metropolis is another big long-term vision. And there was an attempt earlier this year to, to vote about it in, in the Knesset. The, uh, you can look up the Greater Jerusalem bill. And, uh, but eventually the vote did not take place. This was uh, earlier in March this year. Nonetheless, the plan exists and the implementation of these plans is already in place. So maybe the parliament did not vote on the Greater Jerusalem Metropolis uh, Master Plan. Nonetheless, the the work is in progress. More and more colonies and and colony expansion, more and more settler roads, more and more Israeli industrial zones within that area. So everything is in place. What is missing is just to officially declare the the redrawing of the municipal boundaries. So this is a long answer for uh, uh, just to say that there are many plans in place, especially for Jerusalem. And in terms of the population um, balance? Well, it's, it's again hard to find accurate numbers when it comes to Jerusalem, but I can tell you that within the municipal boundaries, which again, don't include all Palestinian neighborhoods and villages of Jerusalem. Many of the neighborhoods and villages were left outside of the municipal boundaries in 67. So when Israel occupied the eastern part, it expanded the municipal boundaries by 74.1 square kilometers, but this was not the full eastern part of Jerusalem. Neighborhoods like Abu Dis and al Azariye, villages like Zayim or uh, Hizma were told in 67, you are no longer Jerusalem. And so if you look at the Israeli municipal boundaries of Jerusalem, the population there is nearing 1 million, almost uh, maybe or a bit smaller than Vienna. And uh, out of these a bit more than 900,000 residents, the Palestinians make 40% of the population. So not down to 30%. Uh, uh, But again, if we consider the full district of Jerusalem, then we would add maybe around 200,000 Palestinians more that live in, in, uh, uh, no, less, sorry, because I'm talking about outside the wall. But I would say uh, maybe around 100 or, or less, tens of thousands of residents who are also residents of Jerusalem, but not included in the Israeli numbers and statistics. Excellent. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that you talked that the political leadership from the city was absent, and, and I think you indicated that might be a good thing. Yes. Um, can you elaborate on this a little bit? Happily. The Palestinian Authority was created with the Oslo Agreement in 1993 or the the, the so-called peace process started a few years before that, and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which up till then was the representative of the Palestinian people, was replaced replaced with the newly created Palestinian Authority. And the Palestinian Authority was part of this new deal that was imposed on the Palestinians, the deal to build a state under occupation, the deal 
is, is standing and, and uh, 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 leaning on the concept of security coordination between Palestinians and Israel. In other words, the security coordination between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli army, which usually does not mean the security of Palestinians. It only means the security of Israelis and settlers. And so the Palestinian Authority is considered by many Palestinians as a traitor, as a, 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 a leadership that has betrayed and continues to betray its people. The Palestinian Authority, first of all, in practicality, in practical means, the Palestinian Authority cannot build a state, cannot run a state when it's under occupation. So to expect that Palestinian ministries would work normally and naturally is, is outrageous because the occupation is there to prevent that. So the Palestinian Authority is just an image of Palestinian sovereignty, of Palestinian authority, of Palestinian control. We have none of that. And the Palestinian Authority has no power and no authority. And so uh, 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 on the macro level, on the political, uh, uh, ideological level, it's a problem to have the Palestinian Authority and the illusion that Palestinians can actually build a state when colonization continues. The, the, the whole deal of, of Oslo was, Palestinians, we will give you uh, prosperity if you give us peace. So we will allow economic development in Palestine if you stop resisting. So in other words, Palestinians be occupied in silence, be occupied in peace, and uh, 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 the Palestinian Authority is the, 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 the contractor that is implementing this deal. So the Palestinian Authority is considered a contractor and a collaborator of the occupation rather than the protector of Palestinian visions or the protector of Palestinian rights in, in Jerusalem. Adding to this, the Palestinian Authority is another oppressive authority that uh, does not allow freedom of speech, does not allow freedom of organizing. And many Palestinians who are active, who are community organizers or activists in, in, or even journalists are uh, uh, detained and jailed for speaking up or for asking questions, sometimes even asking questions about corruption and not even about politics. Uh, so, for example, there was the story uh, uh, a few years ago of a Palestinian journalist who is a reporter in economics. He's, he's just an economic, economy reporter. He uh, uh, um, posted a question about a certain uh, uh, economic plan uh, that the Ministry of Economy had published itself. And because the questions were challenging, uh, he was detained and jailed, and there had to be a whole mobilizing in order for him to be released from jail. So these are just examples of why the Palestinian Authority uh, uh, is, 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 is not a, a Palestinian Authority that is really loyal uh, to its people's aspirations and to its people's struggle for liberation and self-determination, but quite the contrary. So you have your grassroots organizations that are leading the resistance. And yes, I think that we people. need to strengthen our own grassroots. I think mm -hmm. that, uh, um, I mean, look at the Palestinian Authority and, and just the, the artificial meaning of, of having an authority uh, elections it has not, have not taken place in Palestine in a long time. They happened only once and it was the last. Uh, 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 a long time ago, so the whole uh, 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 authority itself is, is outdated. Uh, in addition, the Oslo Agreement itself is outdated. It should have ended in 1999, and we should have signed a final peace agreement, but that never came. So what we believe in is organizing our community, is organizing our grassroots, because we have so many grassroots uh, uh, actors uh, organizations and movements and volunteers that are all working in their own communities on a very low scale, very localized struggles, uh, uh, usually reacting to certain immediate challenges or uh, uh, issues of immediate concern, like land confiscation or home demolition or imprisonment or uh, oppression or lack of infrastructure. And so we believe that this power should be given to the people, the people who know best 
what they need, the people who have the right to determine their own future, the people who need to empower themselves because no one else is going to empower them, not our political leadership and not international aid and certainly not the occupation authorities. And so we believe in us self-empowering our communities, in, in us, uh, uh, first of all, understanding our political reality, second of all, knowing what we need to do immediately, but also creating the space and time to sit down and vision and, and, and build visions for our own uh, society and for our own place, whether it is Jerusalem as a city or a wider uh, uh, spectrum or, I mean, a wider range and, and a general Palestinian, uh, uh, I would say, uh, strategy. There was a third question. Uh, I have many quick, quick questions, but uh, here are a couple. First of all, the easy one is, um, do you, is there also some online resource or maybe a plan for an online version for Wujud? Oh yeah, first of all you can buy the PDF version online. I mean for those who don't want to buy the physical book they can always buy a digital version of Wujud with all of the links and, and, and uh, 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 links whether to our website or other websites. But in addition we are currently working on the mobile application. So there will be a Wujud mobile application because indeed I love books I just read in, in some coffee shop the other day, uh, I saw a sticker that says, books are always cool. I think that, but I know that many, uh, especially the young generation is moving away from books and many people now just walk around with their mobiles uh, uh, wherever they go. And so we are working on the Wujud mobile application so that people can actually take it and walk around with it in the streets of Jerusalem. And we are also working on the Arabic version, of course. <coughs> and, and, um I want to get a sense from you about the situation in Jerusalem. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe, like, maybe there's something that came to mind. But uh, mm -hmm. what I what I was thinking is that you know maybe the Jerusalemites are the most oppressed community under the Zionist boot because everyone is working. All the all the elements of the system is working against them. But but maybe there's something happening these days. I that, have to comment though is about your. I have to comment about your statement. Yeah, uh, I will not let it pass. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that it is smart of us to compare who is more oppressed. I think that's exactly what the Israeli occupation wants, that we look at each other as rivals, as people who are competing about a certain uh, uh, um, a privilege. Uh, the creation of different Palestinian groups that have different, different sets of privileges is exactly the colonial tool. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, I wouldn't agree to it ide ideologically, and I don't think that the situation in Jerusalem is worse than the one in Gaza. So, I mean, let's not go there. Uh, uh, nonetheless, the situation in Jerusalem is harsh. And uh, I mean, we can see how the city is changing, and it's changing rapidly. Uh, if you were lucky to visit Jerusalem in the past, I bet you that it looks different than when you visited, even if the, your visit was just a couple of months ago. Uh, the, 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 the face of the city, the shape of the city uh, changes with the uh, extension and the growth of the colonial control. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, today, there are three watchtowers built just outside of Damascus Gate. Damascus Gate is the main entrance to the old city. It is the entrance from the north. It is the entrance that is for us, the Palestinians, the main entrance. Uh, and uh, uh, the Israeli propaganda when it comes to, to tourism, by the way, is to move uh, the main entrance to the city from Damascus Gate, which is uh, uh, our own uh, uh, main public sphere, and move it to Jaffa Gate, which is the western gate to the old city, because then you can very simply just walk from the western part where the map uh, 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 centers your visit, and you can still peek into the old city, but then again, you know, go back and, and, and go back to the west. So today, there are three military watchtowers built at Damascus Gate. They are not uh, ugly, cold, uh, 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 metal watchtowers. They are incorporated within the architecture of the old uh, city and the surroundings of, the, uh, of Damascus Gate. So they are built with the Jerusalem stone, the thick Jerusalem stone, in order to fit the architecture around them. But they are three watchtowers where soldiers are standing 24 hours a day, uh, again, stopping Palestinians, monitoring Palestinians, searching on Palestinians, detaining Palestinians, humiliating Palestinians. 
And today, even though this is a very recent development, there is an even more recent development. Right next to one of those watchtowers, today, the Israeli occupation is building a new museum. It's going to be called the Roman Museum. And so this museum is another change in, in, in the face of the city. And I'm just talking about the face of the city. I'm not talking about the enhanced displacement and the growing maybe number of Palestinians that move out of Jerusalem or are pushed out of Jerusalem. So the situation is, in Jerusalem is quite hard. And uh, the Israeli uh, uh, policies and the Israeli Zionizing policies are, and plans are implemented continuously. Uh, the, the Israeli colonial machine never stops. No colonial machine ever stops, and it keeps working all the time, expanding settlements, moving and bringing more people, uh, uh, Israelis, to live in Jerusalem, building a business district, uh, expanding municipal boundaries, expanding colonies around the eastern part. So all of this is happening, and it continues. At the same time, there is a lot of Palestinian mobilization taking place, and that is another part of the story, that is another part of my report that is important to give you. Palestinian communities, Palestinian groups, Palestinian individuals wake up every morning despite this horrible reality, and creatively and in very inspiring ways mobilize and do something to create the change that they wish to see in their communities. And I consider Wujud, we consider Wujud another uh, invitation to you to come and see this and support it in the right way. Because people don't lose hope. People wake up every morning despite the fact that it must be very easy to say, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm just going to move and try to live a quiet life somewhere. People wake up every morning and try to organize their community and create change in their community. And uh, uh, again, very inspiring, very creative. And, and, and I think that should be part of what we report on coming from Jerusalem. <laughs> <Shukran>. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if, there, if, if this information specifically exists, but I can tell you that uh, a, um, a big part of it is thanks to or <laughs> due to uh, the, Israeli, the, act, the actions and activism of the Israeli Ministry of Tourism that is very proud to report on the growing number of tourists and the growing number of, of uh, people visiting Jerusalem especially. And, um, uh, part of these uh, actions that the ministry has been doing is, for example, um, uh, open a new airport, international airport in the south. So today, around near Emir Rashrash, which is no known today as Elat, there is a, a new in Israeli international airport. In addition, there are more direct flies that did not exist before into, into Palestine. So, for example, today there is a direct flight between China and Palestine. So uh, it is creating these options, creating these possibilities. There was also, I, I'm sorry, I cannot remember the name of the country, but there is a, an Arab country that allowed Israeli commercial flights to fly in, uh, uh, above it, above its ground. And this has made it also much easier to bring tourists from other destinations into, into Palestine and as a result into Jerusalem. So there is a lot of policy in, in place, a lot of policy and cooperation between policymakers and capitalists and business owners and companies that are making this happen uh, together. Okay, there was a question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah.
كلها نقطيات. انا كتير شكرا لك كثير شكرا شكرا. You can also do you want to translate that? Up to you. <laughs> so, but I'm my mom. Is Mick? And Sam. So and Sam was born in Gaza. She lives here, and she was just saying that. Uh, uh, it's important to have books like Wujud not only for the people here but also for Palestinians who cannot make it to Jerusalem and that it is a, 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 there is a lack in finding information about the city and about Palestine f for someone that cannot come to, to Jerusalem legally since she was born in Gaza even with her foreign passport. She cannot come to Jerusalem so uh, she's grateful for the opportunity to have a book like Wujud and she says I, like, I, I am part of the youth that are happy about this book uh, and I, I am for me this is very moving and and this is one of the most appreciated feedbacks that I uh, received or we received for Wujud because uh, I'm going to comment on uh, on your own comment and say that when we made Wujud we had a big dilemma because we do think that visiting Palestine under Israeli occupation is normalizing the Israeli occupation and so at the same time we were aware that millions of people come and we need also to affect their and influence their uh, uh, experience in, 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 uh, during their visit. But at the same time, we consider Wujud as a book to have on your shelf even when you are not visiting Jerusalem. It brings Jerusalem to you as well. So we do consider it as a source of information, as a book, not only as a tour guide, but also a book that can take you on a tour in Jerusalem even if you are not physically there. Okay, yes, please. Uh, She started by saying that the Palestinians outside of Palestine do their best to uh, pass on 
the story to their children, to pass on the language, to pa pass on the culture, and to keep the, the Palestinian identity alive also in exile. And uh, she g went on to saying that we, uh, uh, as Palestinians, deserve to live, we, we deserve to live uh, 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 normally, and that in order to do that, we need uh, uh, true support and solidarity, and that people would join their voices to our voices and, and speak up against the injustice and the occupation, and uh, uh, that uh, she is happy also for the book, and that uh, she, might, uh, she will certainly read it, and I thank you for that, and uh, hopefully also read it within uh, a group, which is a brilliant idea. <laughs> Okay, so if there are no more questions, I say thank you so much for, for your lecture thank and you. for the, your answers. Um, I really want to recommend to, to buy this book. We have some uh, books um, on the table there. It's uh, 28 euro with, uh, with, with, a, the map. with a map. Or you can also only buy the map. It's 5 euro. Um, just not, not to support uh, uh, Grassroots Jerusalem or to show solidarity, but I think to support yourself in getting a deeper understanding of, of, the, of the situation. It's really a recommendable book. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming, thank you for viewing. We have snacks and drinks uh, in, in, in behind, so we have possibility to talk in a more informal way. Um, this was the last event in the old Darajinu, the new Darajinu will be in the 16th district, in the Demergasse 1, so the next event will be there. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for this. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you.